And now without further delay, let's get started with today's event. Sponsored by Mach 7 Technologies and hosted by Health Data Management. I would now like to turn things over to your moderator, Mike Perkowski. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's web seminar. We're certainly glad that you could participate in our program, the seven critical capabilities of an enterprise imaging platform. As you heard, today's program is going to be an interactive panel discussion involving three industry experts who will talk about real-world issues on, um, surrounding the topic of enterprise imaging platforms in the healthcare industry. Fortunately, our program today is going to be led by Eric Rice, Chief Technology Officer at Mach 7 Technologies. Eric has spent nearly two decades in evaluating and designing clinical informatics solutions for the healthcare industry, and we're fortunate to have him today to share some of his insights and to lead our panel discussion. As you heard, after our panel discussion concludes, we will have an audience Q&A program, so we want to encourage you to submit your questions in advance. We'll get to as many of them as time allows. So with that, I'd like to turn our program over now to our panel discussion leader, Eric Rice at Mach 7 Technologies. Eric, the ball is now yours. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, before we get kicked off too much into the, the meat of the webinar, I'd like to uh, talk just a little bit about you know, Mach 7 and, and kind of the idea around why we're here to talk about seven critical capabilities. Uh, you know, at Mach 7, we have a uh, pretty formal methodology around continuous improvement, from continuous improvement from a support perspective to how we support our customers to how we service our customers, but also continuous improvement to how we continue to evolve our products and roadmap and our vision. Uh, and certainly, I think we, Mach 7, we have a, a strong vision and strong uh, insight into how to provide value back to our customers, but, you know, who knows more about their business than our customers themselves? Uh, so as we develop products, as we service our customers, we're always asking through a process of continuous improvement, you know, what have we done well and what can we do better? And we learn from our customers and our partners every single day. Uh, and from that, we have discovered there are some common themes. Uh, and, and from those common themes, I give credit, I guess, to our marketeers here. Uh, you know, we pick the, the top seven, hence we are Mach 7. Uh, but with that, those top seven uh, kind of common themes that we've picked out from our customers and we've learned from and we've, we've developed our solutions around, you know, are as follows. Uh, one, we hear time and time again from our customers that that intuitive point and click uh, graphical user interface is really important. So when you're configuring your VNA, when you're configuring your workflow engine, your routing engine, your prefetch rules, uh, when you're working within that enterprise imaging platform, having that intuitive point-and-click user interface is really important to our customers. Uh, also, having insight into the real-time traffic, the real-time imaging data, the real-time unstructured clinical data going through the enterprise imaging platform is very important. Uh, having an intelligent technology backbone that's built on the latest and greatest technologies and can, can build and grow with an organization has been important, which goes right into simplified scalability. Uh, when you start running, running low on storage, how easy is it to add additional disk? How easy is it to add a new storage device? How easy is it to scale up your platform, new servers or new functionality uh, without having to do rip and replace and, and larger uh, engagements? Uh, we also hear a lot from our customers around how pure and organic a platform is. How standards-based is it? Uh, when, that, when we send you an AVI file from endoscopy or a TIF image from ophthalmology or a DICOM study from radiology and cardiology, you know, what format are you truly going to store it in? And how, how is that going to help me to reduce those future switching costs and enable that data to be guaranteed to be pure uh, standards-based in the future? Uh, also around communicate, exchange, and share, you know, as one of the core, excuse me, as one of the core uh, maybe value propositions of a VNA, how do we consolidate all this data across all of the disparate sites, even within a single department of radiology? You know, a lot of our customers have many different PAC systems that are involved, uh, but beyond just radiology, cardiology, dermatology, wound care, 
uh, ophthalmology and so forth, how do we provide a consolidated platform that better enables us to communicate the data, to exchange it, and to share it? And lastly, time and time again, we hear from our customers around the value of a partnership. You know, there is, I've yet to see a solution in the market today that has every single feature that any customer wants. You know, there's always enhancement requests coming in, uh, and how is it that you partner with your solution provider, with your vendor, uh, to get those types of uh, solutions uh, built into your environment so you can continue to improve patient care. So with that, so with those seven critical capabilities, I would like to introduce our panel of experts uh, that we have today. These are all customers of Mach 7 uh, and experts in their own ways and from their own types of organizations. You know, we thought today it would be important not only to, you know, bring a single customer from a single, single type of organization, but to have a broad mix across the industry. So first I'd like to introduce David Marischal. He's the CTO at RIS, uh, RIS Imaging or Radiology Imaging Specialist. Uh, second, Ronaldo Montman is the VP of IT from Broward, which is a uh, IDN in southern parts of Florida, has academics and community hospitals engaged with, as, along with his colleague, Boris Kelly Tenko, uh, who's a senior PACS admin at Broward Health. So as we go through this webinar, uh, we're going to go through each of those seven critical capabilities, and I want, you know, for the webinar attendees, you know, hear, hear directly from David, Ronaldo, and Boris, you know, how these different critical capabilities have provided value within their organizations. So first, we'll jump into in, intuitive point-and-click user interface. And before I hand it over to you, David, uh, I'd like to just highlight, you know, when we talk about intuitive point-and-click user interface, at Mach 7, and it's about going into a customer site, uh, whiteboarding the workflows, the challenges, and the solutions that we need to implement, and how easy that is to turn that into a production environment, how quickly we can turn a whiteboard session into a, a environment. And David, at this time, if I could hand it over to you, it would be great if you could share some of how these kinds of capabilities in the Mach 7 Enterprise Imaging Platform is provided value at risk imaging. Sure. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about our story here in Central Florida. Just to give you a very quick background, uh, I'm the CTO for a, a very busy and uh, growing radiology group that uh, has partnerships with uh, various hospitals as well as uh, our own imaging centers and joint ventures with some of the hospitals and some imaging centers. We also um, take in and, and partner. Uh, we have images coming in from various uh, physician offices that do their own imaging, and then we also have partnerships with multi-specialty practice clinics uh, where we help them uh, manage and and uh, provide professional services in terms of the radiologist reads as well as uh, some some of the IT support for the radiology departments in some of these multi-specialty clinics. So we have our fingers um, in, in quite a, a lot of different types of, of work in the Central Florida area. And so it's very complex. We have multiple uh, patient IDs that we're having to deal with, and we have uh, many different workflows and many different systems that we have to actually either interface or integrate with. Um, to Eric's point, and even in the slide that you're seeing today, you know, we, when we were mapping out our strategy for converting from a traditional PAX environment and going into a more centralized approach of managing our images, everything coming in through our VNA and, and providing an underlying enterprise platform, um, it, was, it was really important that uh, it was going to be something that we could not not only you know, do with the vendor, but something that we could reproduce ourselves. So one of the things that was great was having that GUI, the, the graphical user interface, as a foundation. So when we came in, we did a lot of whiteboarding, partnering with Mach 7, looked at a, a, all of our different workflows, and then they did some of the work initially setting up some of these workflows. But once we had those templates in place, you could easily follow what they had done 
Um, and so then my team was able to pick the ball up and run with it based on that uh, that user interface because it's laid out as simply as you see in that picture. Um, you know, you can you can when you're configuring it, you can click into each one of those boxes and you can see, okay, how did we set this up here? And then you can you you can copy that and use it as a template for for uh, you know building on other workflows. So, you know, thanks to that intuitive nature, we really were able to just take uh, and build on the foundation that Mach 7 had laid for us, and then, you know, we built a whole lot of workflows ourselves uh, based on that initial, um, you know, the, the initial kickoff. Um, one area that I think is a, is a big highlight and, and a big success is um, women's health and men's health. Um, you know, we, we have a Breast Center of Excellence, uh, we also partner with a, um, a cancer center for that, as well as a uh, uh, urological oncology group in the area. And so our men's health program has really taken off as well. Um, we we were kind of the one of the starting places in Central Florida for um, doing MR and your uh, ultrasound fused uh, targeted ultrasound uh, guided and. Uh, 3D mapped with the with the MR overlaid on top of it uh, biopsies for men's health. So no more of those old saturation biopsies. Um, it was a targeted biopsy. Um, the urological oncologist told us that because we were partnering with them on this, uh, it completely changed the way they managed their uh, prostate cancer patients. And one of the things that was great was being able to automatically manage the way that the image data um, is moved around and routed. No longer did the technologist have to remember, oh, I need to send this to my specialty viewer. Um, you know, and same thing with our breast program. When we're doing our breast MRs, we also do um, MR-guided breast biopsies. Um, you know, it, it really helped automate and um, a, and facilitate the images getting where they needed to be auto without a lot of human intervention, which any, as all of you know that, that are involved in, in healthcare, it's just gotten so busy and so complex and you know, time is money. We're trying to bring value to our customers, um, whether they're physicians, referring physicians or patients. And so you know, the quicker we can accomplish um, a diagnosis and turn that around, the better it is for, for everybody involved. So it's it's really been a, a a big success for us in terms of you know being able to set these things up and just you know basically okay we whiteboarded it here's our wish and then converting that into a real world workflow that's accomplishing um, real clinical you know clinical results that are positive for our patients and our referring physicians. Thanks, David. I remember I remember the days of going through the workflow designs, and I think you know as you just kind of highlighted there, you know, you may spend a week or two or three weeks whiteboarding and trying to figure out exactly how you want your workflows, uh, but there's, there's value to be said in having a solution that once you have that workflow designed and defined on that whiteboard, you know, two days later it was implemented in the solution and data was flowing through it. So, and from that too, the ability to grow upon it and maintain it and so forth. Um, how about uh, Ronaldo or Boris, would you have anything to add? at Broward, and, and maybe to Ronaldo and Boris, uh, uh, if you could give a little bit of a background just around Broward and uh, at a high level. Well, for Broward Health, um, these features were extremely important because uh, Broward Health uh, operates as the highest acuity uh, medical settings in the kind of Broward County. We have uh, trauma level one units and uh, stroke centers. And at that point, every minute, as David mentioned, uh, counts. Uh, intuitive GUI in simplicity of configuration actually translates for us in reduced time to troubleshoot. Our PAX admin team in, uh, from times to times has to work under a, a tremendous pressure where we have a patient already on the table and we don't have time to dig into the multiple menus to troubleshoot the issue. This sim simplistic interface gave us a global view, but on the other hand, it also gives us easy access to the very granular configuration settings. And it's also complemented with a detailed 
log in on a, on a system. So that for us is a win-win situation, which sets up uh, Max Seven uh, step forward from uh, from the, their competitors. Thank you, Boris. And actually, I think that probably segues in nicely into the next critical capability around. If I can get my slide change here. Around real-time monitoring and dashboard. Uh, you know, Boris, I wonder if, or Boris and Ronaldo, I wonder if you two could add on how how the the value of the real-time monitoring and dashboard at Brower has has assisted. Absolutely. This is Ronaldo. Yeah, we've we've built an infrastructure on a medical based on a medical grade network, and a medical grade network, simply put, is a high available redundant network. Uh, so we have things like uh, network switches and routers and servers, uh, workstations, the whole environment uh, monitored on a 24 by 7 basis, um, and uh, with the proper tools and the, and staff. So the picture you see on the slide is. Uh, uh, my staff uh, with Boris on the left, um, and uh, and they work on this uh, in this environment close to our data center on a 24 by 7 basis. These are senior level engineers, and what we have done is we have combined different skill sets from developers, software developers, network engineers, um, server administrators storage area network architects, fax administrators, they're all sharing the same space um, in an attempt to create a cross-functional team that can learn from the environment. Because we don't just monitor up and down uh, statuses, we monitor things on a proactively basis because system performance for us is as critical as up and down. And so through event correlation and analytics, we proactively know what's going on with our environment. Um, and Max 7 functionality fits well within this culture and within our infrastructure because uh, it allows us to have uh, visibility into the workflow. Uh, through live imaging traffic, we can proactively see bottlenecks before they impact uh, workflow. So, um, great. All right. Yeah, very good, Renardo. Thank you. Uh, David, David, would you have anything to add from a, a risk imaging perspective? A absolutely. Uh, I'll just um, dovetail uh, into what Ronaldo was saying in, in the sense that we, um, you know, at being a uh, a private uh, a private practice, you know, owned by physicians, we have limited resources in terms of you know budget, and so we have to we have to stretch every dollar we can, and we we have a very similar setup. We don't have a a very deep bench in terms of you know lots of people on the bench, but the the people we have are um, are very very uh, skilled and knowledgeable in their different domains. And it is a, definitely a cross-functional team. You know, we have a lot of, of folks that need to know what's going on, other systems that are being affected. And so we do something very similar where we have uh, the, the dashboard up and, and people are watching it and making sure that, uh, you know, we're proactively um, reviewing what's going on and, and what's happening because it's, it's incredibly important, especially when you have um, – you know, not just because we we have some hospitals that feed into our system as well. It's not just outpatient. I, I didn't mention that in, in my initial introduction, but we do have some 24/7 um, work coming in, and we have integrations with hospitals where we're reading, um, you know, with uh, Mach 7 as as the backbone that that's uh, feeding and distributing that info, the uh, the image data. So we have to make sure that those images are are, are transferring um, in a, in a timely way uh, to make sure that we're you know, we're getting those those stat ER reads, especially the the stroke the stroke alerts um, and some of the other critical values uh, turned around as as quickly to our hospitals and ERs as as they expect it. So it's incredibly important and very valuable for us as well. Great. Good. Yeah, I know we hear from from many of our customers that you know the value is not only in 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 monitoring you know our solution, our Mach 7 solution, but really having that true enterprise. Uh, monitor monitoring all all unstructured medical imaging data coming through a system uh, that can 
past or you know, not only of our solution uh, and what may be going on, but also you know downstream systems that may be receiving uh, receiving feeds from the platform. Uh, and with that too, I thought maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about the next uh, critical capability around intelligent technology backbone. Uh, and and when I talk about intelligent technology backbone, I think one thing is you know how can your VNA, how can your workflow engine, how can your solution bring new capabilities into your environment that may be able to enhance the workflows, you know, beyond what more traditional systems out there are doing. So from a image level processing to a, a, a intelligent distribution of images off of modalities, to how thing, how data can be localized, and how this single platform, single backbone can handle not just the DICOM images, but again the HL7 the XDS, the web services, and so forth. Uh, with that, uh, Boris and Ronaldo, would you have any comments around this and how that provided value at Broward? This is Boris. Um, at Broward Hills, uh, we uh, took a very detailed look at our design of our uh, production image flow. And we realized that uh, we have some limitations that um, we inherited with the older technology. Uh, when we considered uh, Max 7 uh, integration with our imaging uh, system, we uh, looked at how can we improve and uh, elevate our um, pain points and uh, uh, remove our bottlenecks. One of the things that uh, we leveraged uh, Max 7 uh, implementation, uh, we uh, deliver a load balancer and start governing load balancer through the Max 7 servers that allow us to evenly distribute um, image traffic through um, local procs because we have uh, four hospitals and one large outpatient center uh, that uh, located throughout the Broward County. That actually uh, yield a good result. It's not just only uh, made us, our system stable, but also allowed us to uh, manipulate the study uh, prior to uh, archiving them or delivering them to uh, diagnostic workstations. For instance, uh, we can uniformly configure some DICOM tags uh, before, uh, even if we encounter a human error on the technology side. Let's say they mistype um, one of the uh, input fields, uh, the system can intelligently uh, correct it so that downstream uh, workstations will interpret it and provide our radiologists with consistent experience. We have much less uh, error um, related to uh, this type of uh, mishaps uh, with implementation of a Max 7. Other consideration was how that will, uh, introduction of additional layer will uh, impact our throughput. And we were uh, surprised to find out that Max 7 servers actually uh, perform quite well in our environment. Um, I guess uh, the contributing factor is that the routing protocol in Max 7 based on an image uh, rather than study. So in other words, it uh, forwards to the destinations as soon as it uh, uh, gets the first image out of series. Uh, then the practical exam, a CT of the brain, takes about 13 seconds to be processed by uh, Max 7 servers. We're very pleasantly uh, surprised with that, and uh, the ability to monitor it gives us all the tools and uh, confidence to make sure that um, it is not a bottleneck and we are performing at the top. Very good. Thank you, Boris. Hey, so, somewhat on a similar topic and a similar capability around scalability, David, I wonder, I wonder, risk imaging, if you could talk a little bit about how that technology backbone and scalability capabilities of the platform 
uh, have been important to you. Sure. I'll, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd like to uh, talk about that experience because, you know, as, as anyone knows, whenever you're making the decision to uh, make a change in, you know, one of the major, you know, speaking of backbones, the backbones of your business in, in the radiology world, um, obviously, you know, PACs and, and archiving and, um, you know, all those things have been a, a you know, a staple of, of uh, radiology workflow for, you know, over a decade now, some you know, close to two decades in some cases. And, you know, so it's not a small decision. So one of the things that we looked at, uh, we knew we were, we're we've been on, been on a pretty rapid, um, you know, growth pattern for, for quite a while. And we also had some existing infrastructure that we, we wanted to make sure we could leverage. We, we'd spent the last um, five years converting everything to a virtual environment, and I think uh, Boris could speak to this as well, Boris and Ronaldo. Um, you know, when, when you make that investment and you set up a high availability environment, um, you know, one of the things we, when we were talking to various vendors about, you know, our consideration, that we're under consideration for being our, our, our enterprise imaging platform, our vendor neutral archive vendor was, you know, what, what's your plan or, you know, how do you deal with high availability and backups and, and um, redundancy and, you know, those types of, of, of issues, you know, your business continuity plans as well as your disaster recovery. And, you know, we had already, from the, from the business side of things, you know, with all our business um, systems, we had already moved everything over into our virtual environment. And so we were really, the answer we wanted to hear was, you know, you're going to have to do it our way. Uh, we didn't want to hear that. We wanted to hear, um, you know, oh, we can fit right into your existing infrastructure and we can, we can you know, leverage it in a way that's going to meet your needs. Um, and that's exactly, you know, in, in talking with um, Mach 7 and, you know, Eric and his team, when we explained to them what we were looking for, they said, oh, absolutely, you know, we can do that. Because we have, um, and I think, um, I think the Broward folks are, are similar, you know, we have, we have uh, a couple of data centers and we wanted to make sure that we could do dual rights and that whenever we wanted to expand on the on the back end, if we needed to add storage, that it was going to be a simple process that would fit right in with what we we're already doing as far as expanding our SAN, um, and and you know leveraging writing on our our, our HA environment as it, as it was, and not having to reinvent the wheel. And that really translated into savings for us because we didn't have to re-engineer anything. We were able to just you know fit it right into what we had already spent a lot of time and effort and money doing. Um, so that was, that was hugely important for us. And the ability, and I think it's really cool, I think, um, you know, we can, we can do dual rights. So we know that, you know, if there's ever a problem with, um, you know, writing to one archive, we have a copy on the other one. And uh, I believe, Eric, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there is a verification process to make sure that those rights occur at both archives so that we're, you know, we don't have any corruption or the data is clean. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if Boris wants to, Boris or, or, or um, Ronaldo want to talk about that because that, that was hugely important for us. Certainly, David. I can certainly speak to it. You know, we certainly, uh, one of the nice things uh, was the ability to leverage our infrastructure and uh, highly, avail highly available infrastructure between, you know, Miami and Fort Lauderdale data centers. Uh, a very similar scenario like you described in your case. Um, our goal was to achieve zero outage, have 100% it is to have 100% uptime um, on, on this solution. And, um, and certainly we lever leverage a number of technologies uh, to make this happen. And Max 7's infrastructure just fits well within uh, what we have in place. Uh, so, in terms of, we also realize uh, significant savings. Um, you know, when we had way back in uh, 2010, when we uh, decided to uh, move off from an old PAX vendor to the incumbent vendor, um, we had we incurred the cost of of migrating over two and a quarter million studies. Uh, so that was an over a three-year window. So that was a significant cost that we had to incur, not even not even not even talking about operational operationally how that impacts uh, things in, in in the medical centers. So we we had to migrate over two point uh, and a quarter 
million studies. Um, if we decided to continue with our PAX vendor and not thinking about a uh, DNA solution uh, with MAX7, in 2019, we would have been in a position where we would have to migrate about 6 million studies if we decided to change vendors, if we decided to change vendors at that time. Having uh, now with a DNA solution, with MAX7 solution in place, we are avoiding all that cost. And we are in, you know, we're going to have a solution in place for when we're ready to transition off from PACs um, without having to incur uh, the cost of migrating and the time that it takes to migrate 6 million studies. Uh, so that's huge. The second thing, too, is that it, our incumbent PACs vendor um, doesn't allow us to purge old studies, you know, those studies that are uh, over seven years old. And with the current solution with Max7, we are able to do so, and we are reducing our um, costs in terms of storage reduction costs uh, by 37% by having the ability to purge old studies. So that's a significant, a significant cost reduction as well. Um, I remember going into a board meeting and uh, meeting with. Uh, uh, my CFO and um, and going through the explanation, the, R, the return of the cost of ownership, and uh, for 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 implementing Max Seven solution, and it, it it was it was not for the first time not a difficult discussion. It was a very reasonable discussion that I had with uh, the financial folks because because of this savings, you know, and. Uh, um, so uh, we're very pleased that we just made that decision and uh, we're moving forward with that. Great, thank you. Sure. As we wrap up, as we wrap up on this slide too, you know, I, I think we've heard a lot about uh, whether it be risk imaging and how they're growing and how they need to be able to add storage in a flexible way or add additional server processing capabilities in a flexible way. Uh, I think we've also heard from Broward how having that infrastructure and the high availability and, you know, the, the processing capabilities working in active, active, uh, uh, active, active way have all been important. We also do want to highlight, too, you know, from a functional uh, scalability perspective, you know, our customers also have that ability to plug in new capabilities, new functional capabilities through the plug-in framework, you know, without having to take a new release. You know, new plugins can be developed uh, to, to scale out the functional side of things as well. Uh, with that, I will uh, move on to the next topic around pure and organic platform. Uh, and actually, I'll probably go back to, to uh, Broward on this topic. Uh, when we talk about pure and organic platform, again, we talk about a platform built around standards base. Uh, so when you, when you send a platform, and if you're out there looking for a VNA or an enterprise imaging platform today, I think it's an important question to ask. You know, how does that archive, how does that platform store a DICOM study? Does it wrap it? Uh, does it store it in its native format? Um, and, and there may be good, good reasons for both uh, or one or the other, but having that flexibility uh, to be able to have a platform that can store things in their native format, store things that are standards-based uh, is important. And with that, uh, Ronaldo and or Boris, do you have any comments around that? Well, absolutely. Now, when uh, we look from an uh, enterprise imaging standpoint, we all are uh, very well aware that it is not a DICON world anymore. Um, our clinicians request to be able to uh, view and exchange images that are acquired uh, with a visible light. Um, there is a, a other source of imaging or even a waveform that um, need to be archived, and they are clinically significant for uh, patient care of today, especially for a collaboration between different specialties uh, in a clinical world. And our enterprise imaging system they needs to deliver uh, that uh, information to uh, clinicians um, without uh, any delays. We need to uh, facilitate uh, uh, a conversation between uh, an emergency room physician and ophthalmologist or uh, across the different specialties, radiology and a, and a trauma surgeon. 
from this standpoint, we uh, knew from the get-go that uh, platform should be able to digest and process any type of input study. And uh, the most common scenario is that if something is sent to the archive from the acquisition device, that would be requested from the archive by the same device. So the question is, why uh, transfer into a different format? Why would we not save it just as is? Save in time, save in space, and uh, provide native format back to the requesting device. From that standpoint, we looked at the um, various vendors, and Mac7 uh, had a straightforward solution that is based on store as is. They ingest the studies, and they produce it back the way it was before. One of the good examples that we kind of um, encountered at the very beginning was uh, introduction of uh, PTO objects. Uh, the breast tomography uh, unit was uh, introduced to broad health environment, and uh, it came with its own proprietary storage. And uh, we said, uh, guys, uh, we can store it in a vendor neutral archive. And uh, the vendor that uh, brought the machine, they said, oh no, this is the appropriate format. Uh, only uh, our drive, uh, hard drives can store it. And they pinned the uh, engineers at Max 7 tested out, and sure enough, uh, they could store and query from a Max 7 archive. That was one, uh, one of the first um, studies that we start archiving in our project. And uh, it's not just uh, we saved Broward Health money on not purchasing uh, proprietary storage from the vendor, but also provides an enterprise approach to that. Yeah, very good. Uh, David, uh, risk imaging, would you have anything to add around? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I will, um, and I'll make it quick because I know we're, we're, we're getting tight on time here, but what I will say is that our, our former PACs, we, we've since transitioned to, to a different viewer, but our former PACs, uh, the archive was stored in a proprietary fashion, and, um, and it, it, it uh, was not always uh, so very good at interoperating with other, with other systems, with other uh, you know, specialty viewers, or even, um, you know, to, to Boris's point with the BTO, you know, it couldn't even handle the BTO, um, so it, it had to store it as a secondary capture uh, object, which uh, those of you that know the, you know, the, the tomosynthesis vendors that are out there for breast, uh, you know, 3D breast, uh, that's a very difficult process because you have to take that and then, um, you know, put it back out, and then it has to be translated into the native BTO for the viewer to to uh, be able to interpret it properly for the slices. So um, very cumbersome. So you know, being able to actually store in a native um, format uh, that's not proprietary and that's not a secondary capture is is a real advantage. And uh, you know, it's it's a real win-win for for those of us that are you know getting further and further into the 3D breast world. Uh, but you know, for any of these other ologies that are out there, we uh, although we primarily deal with DICOM um, in our practice, we do have some um, interventional radiologists that uh, we uh, run clinics and they do some vein care as well as uh, some wound care work. And so it's important that you can you can capture and store those um, those light images that they're they're capturing for for those uh, situations. Very good, David. Thank you. you know, I think both as David, you and uh, Boris highlighted, there's some similarities there around you know, having that pure platform to really enable flexibility with your viewers and whether it be uh, you know, the Tomo viewers need to get the images back in their native formats or ECG strips need to come back in their native formats. Uh, I think that's important. Also helping out with those future switching costs. You know, if your data is pure and native, then it's going to really simplify that and lower some costs. Um, I'd also highlight too that you know with the platform there there may be cases at individual sites where it makes sense to uh, it makes sense to wrap something. Actually, we, we have had uh, other customers who who have asked uh, you know here's a 
here's an EKG strip and a PDF document. I want to be able to view it on my cardiology packs, can wrap it so it can in DICOM so it can be viewed there. Uh, again, at Mach 7, we generally always coach our customers to keep everything in their native formats, but there may be a case at your site where you want to wrap. And I think that's another benefit of the platform is uh, that's an easy configuration step. Uh, you know, again, we store by default. We're storing everything native. Uh, but if there is that one-off case, it's an easy configuration to manage that. Uh, so moving on here, the next one around communicate, exchange, and share. Um, I wonder, David, if we could go back to you at Risk Imaging, Rizzle, uh, and talk about how how the platform has enabled you to better exchange and communicate and share data. Yeah, absolutely. So, with in our environment, you know, and and I'm sure that uh, it's not unique to us. And, and in fact, I know it's not unique to us. So, hopefully, there are those that are that you know are when they hear this are nodding their heads, going, "Yeah, this is really important." Um, you know, we have subspecialization. We have cardiac readers. We have um, men's health readers. We have women's health readers. We have um, you know PET CT. Um, fusion readers, uh, you know, so, so all those subspecialist radiologists, we need to be able to feed them uh, quickly and easily with, with uh, their images. So again, the turnaround time is important, the quality of the reads is important, um, and, and we, want, we want the right readers reading things at the right time. So we've, we've leveraged several technologies to do that, but, uh, but Mach 7 is, is the backbone that enables that. And you know, when when you need to be able to launch all these different specialty viewers, um, that's critically important. The other thing that we've started working into our workflow this year is a universal work list uh, that will enable that. And um, and and you know, when you talk about communication, exchanging, and sharing, one of the things that um, I think is really important that I should mention that we've been able to do with Mach 7 is is our referring physician community uh, is really important uh, for a lot of them that we enable. Uh, image link sharing uh, with the interfaces that we have going back to their EHRs. So uh, working with Mach 7, we're able to embed that into our um, our ORU feeds, our, our result feeds, out into the EHRs. And uh, with the um, zero footprint um, viewer that's a part of, of Mach 7, um, those those physician offices that referred cases to us were able to, uh, you know, that was one of the checkboxes for their meaningful use stage two, that they're able to, um, uh, you know, they're able to attest to, and that that's been a huge a huge win for us in terms of customer satisfaction and also loyalty. Um, you know, we we've been able to uh, work with these physician groups that have EHRs, and um, and get that feed going to them. Uh, you know, embed that link that goes right back to the Mach 7 zero footprint viewer. So, uh, you know, it doesn't require any special installation as long as they have an HTML5 compatible view, you know, browser. They can just launch it straight within their EHR application, and uh, again, it, it checks that box. So uh, that for us was also very, very important. So all those, all those things are important, but you know, with the meaningful use stage two, and we're all waiting for the last minute to find out what the final rules were going to be. Um, you know, we just found out this month, and so we've we've already been feeding some of our physician offices though that link, so that they would be ready to go when they're ready to attest. So uh, for us, incredibly important the uh, the exchange and sharing of 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 those images through that link. Great, thanks, David. Hey, and uh, actually, for the sake of time, I'm going to hit the last uh, critical capability around partnership. And Ronaldo and Boris, I wonder if, if you would mind talking a little bit about how the value of a partnership with your enterprise imaging platform vendor has been important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I remember way back when we were doing our due diligence to select the DNA, uh, we, we, we put so much hour, so much time into it. We spoke with uh, consulting companies and various people, we did our research. And we, select, we narrowed this, the, the vendor selection to uh, three vendors. And then we selected Max 7. You know, the technology is great. You know, it has, um, we're very pleased with the technology that Max 7 produces. And uh, uh, they have a great, a great uh, real, um, technical roadmap ahead that fits well with, with what we're trying to do. Um, but I think it's equally important to acknowledge and, re and recognize the, um, uh, the people at Max 7. You know, uh, it's not just the technology or processes, right, but it's also the people are critical. And the engineering team uh, has the um, technical and clinical 
leadership um, to help us uh, get off the ground running um, um, and um, and being successful. You know, so to me, um, uh, partnership is cri- partnership is critical. We, um, we have so many people in the staff. We're shorthanded. You know, we leverage our partnerships with our vendors, and we must be able to get it up and running, get it right at the first time, you know, and, and, and get it up and running in no time. And that all depends on the quality of the people that are signed to your account to work with you to get things done. And the uh, um, engineering team at Max7 is just phenomenal and nice people to work with. And I want to add uh, one more thing that uh, kind of uh, – uh, to complement uh, what Ronaldo said, uh, working with the Max7 engineers, um, not only educational for us, but what I really admire them that uh, they're thinking like we do. They think uh, they they have a patient-centric uh, thinking. They don't ask why do you need this. They know why we need this. They know why we ask so much, and they're working with us uh, uh, every step of the way to uh, create either custom solution or uh, the, the roadmap for, uh, for the future. We, we have a very good partnership from the, from the get-go. The only thing I can add to that is ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, very good. You know, with that, you know, there are definitely some questions that have come in. Actually, we're... Uh, with that, we've gone through our seven critical capabilities, but would like to go through some questions. I know Mike, uh, you know, I, Mike, if it's okay, maybe I'll, I will go through some of these for the sake of time uh, and just pick off some. That's sure, okay. Right. Okay. So uh, just coming through the list here, uh, one, there's a question a little bit uh, around workflow and the workflow of capturing visual light images and how it integrates with the EMR and uh, what kind of mobile devices and things like that may be a part of that process and workflow. Uh, certainly at Mach 7, we have integrations with, you, you name it, uh, EMR vendors where uh, we are capturing visual, visual light. We do have our own tools to do that uh, through mobile devices like your iPad, iPhone. Um, uh, and, you know, I think one key thing when you're capturing visual light images, obviously, is, you know, as soon as you leave that radiology or cardiology department, nobody knows what an accession number is. Nobody knows what an order number is. So, you know, that integration with your EMR to integrate to not only the patient demographics, uh, but with the visit information uh, is really, really important. So, you know, with our solutions, you know, when a dermatologist picks up a, a mobile device to take a picture of a rash or something like that, you know, they pick from a list uh, just like a radiology CT tech would do, they, the dermatologist will pick from a list that's generated from their EMR the patient and visit, and then they would take the picture, or they could take the video, or they could take the note, or do the dictation, you know, whatever it may be, and have that all brought back together, stored in the platform, and connected back up to the EMR. So, you know, those types of workflows are, you know, I think very important. Um, uh, you know, as far as uh, David and Boris and Ronaldo on this call, you know, I think. Certainly, David's more in the radiology space, but Boris and Ronaldo, I know that was a, an important capability of the platform when you're looking on your buying decision. I know we haven't quite gotten there yet with your EMR that's uh, on, the, on the phase list for, for the rollout, but uh, Boris or Ronaldo, would you have any comments, additional comments around that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, just uh, uh, statistically, we already know that uh, the main consumer of uh, enterprise imaging is a clinician that accessing it through the EMR. So for us, uh, the tight integration between our uh, enterprise imaging and our EMR is extremely important. That's why we, uh, we're looking into uh, the uh, interface between Cerner, which what we have as an EMR and a Max 7, so that uh, we can flow the images back and forth, and if the um, if the user prefer to use a Cerner viewer, that's perfectly fine. But if they want to adapt a newer technology, that is available too. Yep, very good. Uh, next question uh, on here, um, a little bit about the, the uh, uh, 
the platform and what it's optimized for from a size perspective. You know, again, I think just from our from our our platform, it was really designed to scale from the smallest site up to the largest site. You know, from from a site to 100,000 per million sites a year. Uh, and I think that has to do with that intelligent uh, technology backbone and how you can scale your solution through simply adding in virtual machines or physical servers. They they act active, active actively uh, to distribute the load amongst themselves and and uh, can scale up quite nicely. Uh, and, and with that too, you know, I think it's important when you when you go to a site and you're evaluating solutions. You know, for your particular volume, do you need a rack of servers, or can you do that in two servers? Uh, you know, there's there's certainly a cost impact, uh, not only for the software license, but certainly some vendors may have a much heavier price tag just on the infrastructure required. And you know, I think Mach 7 has been able to really leverage some of the latest technologies to keep those infrastructure costs down while still uh, producing the throughput uh, and scalability needed for even the largest sites. Um, another question, uh, David. I wonder. There's a question in here. I wonder if you could expand a little bit on on uh, you know the workflows you did around Mintel. Yeah. So um, I, I think uh, you know I went in a little bit uh, about that, but uh, you know we had. We had a, a project um, that was, you know, put in front of us, which was to improve men's health in our area. We have a partnership with a cancer center, and so we collaborated with the uh, urology department uh, in the cancer center, and we were looking at ways that we could, you know, not only just improve the on the technological or clinical side of of the modalities, but you know, also on the on the infrastructure that was moving those images around. And so, because of because of the uh, you know we we as as Brower did we put our our VNA uh, in front of the the viewer the PAX viewer and you know everything hits that first so we're able to to really manage whether it's slice thickness uh, the types of images if you have um, you know something in the DICOM header that uh, you want to use as a keyword we can we can manage the correct images that go to our advanced post-processing software specific to men's health. Not only that, but when it's coming back from that, when, when it's been um, you know, touched by the radiologist and they've done their mapping and they're sending it back, we can auto-route it to the, um, to the urology department where they can have their, you know, they can take that and fuse it with their real-time ultrasound images. And then when they're done with it and they send it back to us, then we can archive it. So, so it, was, it was taking a lot of different pieces of, of you know the collaborative effort between the radiologist and the urological oncologist. You know, one was on the diagnostic side, and and mapping out, um, you know, where the urologist should um, go for the, for their biopsies. You know, targeting the biopsy specifically in 3D with the with the MRI. Um, but it's also you know it's also flowing the images bidirectionally between urology and radiology, so that um, you know we're not needing to have a lot of of manual intervention. To, to make that happen, and and so it, it's been you know uh, one of the the important pieces of that is is because we were one of the few places more places have picked this up now and and but we have a lot of folks coming in from from out of town uh, to see the urological oncologist. So it was really important uh, as Boris had talked about turnaround time is so critical. Well, we really needed to make sure that if if we had somebody coming in from out of town, that we were able to actually try to get everything done in a single day. You know, so if they, if they were going to come in from out of town, we needed to get them imaged and then turn back around, get all the images on back on the urology side, so that then they could take the re radiologist targets and put them into their mapping software, so that they could guide it with the ultrasound and hit the right targets in real time. So so that was hugely important, especially when you've got a patient that's in from out of town, they need that quick turnaround time. It was a huge patient care improvement that we were able to accomplish and automate, not only on the on the modality side, but on the on the infrastructure and technology side with the image handling. Very very important. Yeah. Thank you, David. Hey, we just have a couple of minutes left. Actually, uh, one more question around ILM. There's questions around ILM and how that you know what capabilities are there in the platform. Uh, and how it's being used. I know Boris and Ronaldo, you highlighted a little bit around how ILM is helping out with uh, the business case, uh, keeping older slowly away. But 
You know, I also want to highlight, you know, with the platform and when you're evaluating other solutions out there, it's not all just about purging. It's, a, you know, there's a lot of other capabilities that can be available within image lifecycle management uh, to be able to help uh, maintain and, and in some cases reduce storage costs. Uh, so certainly purging is one of those mechanisms, but you know what, with the right capabilities, you know, doing things like, you know what, let's purge off the thin slices after two years and keep the thick slices for a longer period of time. Uh, let's, you know, for any study over seven years that's not mammography or pediatric, you know, maybe let's compress it by 10x. So the clinicians are, still have the imaging data there, uh, but we're greatly reducing the amount of storage on disk. Uh, around those different uh, different studies. So, you know, I think when you're out there evaluating solutions, you know, getting a little bit creative, and we have some customers uh, who have been taken uh, different strategies on this, but uh, there can be more to it than just purging. All right, and, and one last question. I didn't want to derail this webinar, and, and before I answer this last question, I want to thank uh, David, Ronaldo and Boris for uh, for joining us uh, on this webinar, and Mike for uh, ho hosting this for us. And certainly to all the attendees, thank you for uh, being on the webinar. Uh, again, we will we will uh, email we'll send out an email with information where you can download and get a recording of the webinar uh, within the coming week. Uh, also, too, we'll, Mach 7 will certainly have experts at RSNA this year, so if you, you're welcome to go to our website and. Uh, register to meet or speak with one of the one of our many partners, customers, experts uh, to to learn about their experiences and how they have leveraged the platform. Uh, but the one thing I want to, as I have one minute left here, the one thing I want to end on is there is a question in here around uh, there's some recent news on Mach 7 and a merger and, and things like that, which I want to quickly address. Uh, Mach 7 has has entered into an agreement to uh, merge with another publicly held organization, so. You know, with that, Mach 7 is going public. Um, with that, we're quite excited about it, and I think we're excited about it not only for ourselves, but also for our partners and our customers. Uh, you know, Mach 7 will be a public company, and, and, the, and the company we're merging with will change their name to Mach 7. Here will be changed to M7T. Uh, the entire Mach 7 leadership team and executive team uh, remains in place. Uh, the entire product line and solutions that we deliver today will remain as they are today. Actually, the company we're uh, merging with is not another product company, but actually one of our, our distributors. So there's a great augmentation there around uh, our commercial access to uh, get our message out and get our solutions out uh, in the market. Uh, so there's no, uh, there's no uh, confusion around whose product does what and those kind of things. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice cohesive uh, uh, merger and, and greater than that, you know, I think it gives Mach 7 uh, access to some additional capital, which uh, we're looking forward to leveraging and and more quickly and more rapidly going against our strategy and our, our go forward uh, market direction. So we're all very excited about it and uh, look forward to uh, that transaction coming to a close in the next couple of months. So with that, again, thank you to everyone on the call and. Thank you, David and Ronaldo and uh, Boris, and we'll end the webinar at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.